Good afternoon again, everyone. We're going to give it a couple minutes to fill the room up here. Afternoon again, everyone. We'll give it about 30 more seconds to fill the room here. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our Wednesday webinar series. My name is Brett Spatelli. I'm the Vice President of the National here of Advancement here at the National Human Affiliate Foundation. Um, if at any time during the webinar you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, today's Wednesday webinar is on the evaluation of sexual health in people with hemophilia. Today we will also be live streaming on our YouTube and LinkedIn channels. I'm joined today by Mark Skinner, uh, Dr. Federico Germini, Dr. Greg Blamey, and Dr. Elizabeth Clearfield. I will now turn it over to you. Get us started, Mark. Wonderful, and uh, uh, good day to all. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. So as, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, our faculty for today uh, is myself, um, and uh, I think I'm known to many longtime volunteer within the hemophilia community, uh, Dr. Federico Germini from McMaster University, who uh, works with us on the probe study, Dr. Greg Blamey, uh, a physical therapist from the Manitoba Adult Inherited Bleeding Disorders Program uh, in Canada, and Elizabeth Clearfield, who has recently joined uh, uh, my research group and is working with us on the core heme core outcome study for hemophilia gene therapy. So today's topic, uh, next slide please, uh, is going to be in three parts. Uh, we are going to uh, start with Greg, who is going to provide uh, a little bit of context, background, and discuss how sexual health uh, has been uh, presented and considered uh, within his clinical program and some suggestions on how to incorporate uh, this important topic. Uh, then Federico is going to present the results of the research of the uh, uh, probe study, uh, which was recently published in Hemophilia. And then Elizabeth is going to share some emerging work uh, as it relates to the mental health uh, patient reported outcome measurement tool, which we are developing to complement uh, the hemophilia uh, gene therapy program, which we expect to, uh, to arrive sometime soon. Um, I guess just as one brief bit of background, uh, sexual health has often been a taboo topic or one that has not been fully discussed and considered uh, within hemophilia or has not been well understood as it specifically relates, uh, relates to those that live with bleeding disorders. And so what we hope today can do is to provide some context, uh, some ideas, and a little bit of background why this is important uh, to our community. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Greg and then each speaker in turn will turn it over uh, to the next and we'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, and you can actually advance to the, to the next slide, Brett, thank you. Um, thanks, Mark, for that uh, introduction. And um, I think you encapsulated quite nicely why this topic is so important. So I'm really happy to see webinars like this and to see this topic coming up on conference programs uh, more and more around the world. Usually when I do a talk of any kind, I usually start with an objectives uh, slide for what I'm trying to accomplish in that talk. And this felt a little more um, akin to trying to identify what the real challenges are with this particular topic. So Brett, you can advance uh, uh, three more times and some uh, challenges are gonna come up and one more as well, please, Brett. So first of all, I think what we wanna to try to do and one of the big goals here is to standardize how we view sexual health and sexuality as components of overall health, the same way that we think about some of the more talked about or commonplace um, elements of health that, that everybody's familiar with. And having webinars like this, I think it's just gonna go a long way to increasing that familiarity for people. Bigger than that, I think is normalizing what I would call a culture of permission for people to discuss this topic. Um, and it's not about extracting information from people and it's not about forcing the conversation either. This is about making sure that people who engage with us as healthcare providers are um, 
allowed and feel allowed to bring up any topic they like, including sexuality and sexual health. And I have at the Hemophilia Treatment Center in small font there because it's also about making sure that this is done when the person feels most comfortable and in the environment that they feel most comfortable. And that may not be at the comprehensive care clinic. That might be when they're seeing the social worker in their office or seeing myself for a physiotherapy treatment. And so really it's about having the conversations when the person wants to discuss it or the couple wants to discuss it. We need to find out in all of our jurisdictions where the resources are for people to get the kind of help that they might be looking for when it comes to sexual health. And we need to make sure that we have communication uh, links between our clinics and those people, the same way that we do with dental offices when people need a dental referral. If someone asks me a question about their sexual health, I need to know who to send them to, and I have to have that information available uh, at hand so that the, the services can be accessed quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my involvement in this topic really kind of uh, crystallized around the 2006 WFH Congress in Vancouver. Next slide. And I presented at that conference at a patient uh, from our clinic. And I want you to bear in mind that at the time I'm talking about here, standard half-life products are what were used in Canada. There was no extended half-life or novel therapy stuff going on at that point. And what we identified was a young man who had a series of iliopsoas muscle bleeds. And I think the more shocking and alarming discovery was that the advice that we had been giving him was contributory to those bleeds happening. And they were happening because of sexual activity and sexual intercourse. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a diagnostic image that shows you, if you look at that, that's a, a, an image taken through the pelvis. And if you look on the right side versus the left side, they should be mirror images. And I'm not sure if, if you can see my cursor, if you can only see Brett's, but there's a very large iliopsoas muscle bleed on the right hand side that does not correspond with what you see on the left. Uh, next slide, please. And really at that time, this was, as Mark talked about in the introduction, a taboo topic. We didn't discuss this kind of stuff with our patients at all. And what we found when we looked at this gentleman's case was that the advice we'd been giving him, which was to infuse in the morning, I think in fact, we used the terminology that it was a waste of product to infuse at night before he went to bed because don't you know, everybody just turns the lights off and goes to sleep uh, after they um, you know, have had their busy day. Uh, not in his case, that certainly wasn't the case. The most active time of his day was after the lights were turned off. Um, and when we looked at when his bleeds really occurred, they were occurring just hours before his next infusion was due. So his trough levels were very low. And again, shockingly, you know, when we realized that what we had been saying to him was, you know what, while you're trying to recover from all these bleeds, all you should be doing is restricting your activity to your activities of daily living which in fact for this young man included sexual activity. So again, there was a lot of miscommunication and it was all coming from the fact that we didn't pay attention to this element of his and everybody's um, life as a human being, nothing to do with the bleeding disorder. Next slide, please. Um, and so if I take the, um, review of his records off the table and we look at the things that we had been telling him, I'm happy to say that these three bullet points that you see here now no longer go on at our clinic. These are things that we never ever do anymore because we've, we've learned partly from his case, but we also found once we started to change the way we looked at these things, that there were a lot of other patients in our clinic who fell into the same kind of category that this young man did. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, interestingly, reality television knew that injuries were happening from sexual activity. And not only did they know, they were willing to talk about it in prime time. And we had a lifespan clinic where we were dealing with patients over their entire lifetime. And yet it was a topic that never came up even for discussion. So there was a lot of learning going on, I think, in those days. And this is, again, is in the, sort of the early 2000s for us at our clinic. Uh, next slide. I'm really reluctant to profile people per se, but if I had to say who I think you should be looking at, if you're a care provider or if you are a person with a bleeding disorder or, or related to somebody or in a relationship with somebody who has one, um, look at, at iliopsoas muscle bleeds, particularly if you can't seem to find why these iliopsoas muscle bleeds could be occurring or reoccurring, sexual activity might be part of the spectrum. If you have a recent bleed into a joint or a muscle, sexual activity is something that can spark a re-bleed 
Of course, target joints are always going to be an issue. And remember that any muscle, any joint can bleed if it's overloaded and, and you uh, exceed the tolerance. But I want to be clear that this is not just about preventing injuries from having sex or bleeds from having sex. This is about making sure that people can maintain a healthy sex life in the face of whatever is going on for them. And so if you've had a recent surgery, if you've had some other kind of situation going on that limits your mobility, we want to be there to help you if you need and if you like to find ways that will allow you to maintain your, your um, uh, engagement with your partner in a, in a sexual relationship while you are recovering from whatever it is that's going on. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, hit the animation another few times again, and one more time, and another time yet. So um, adolescents, older adolescents, young adults, statistically, that's why I see most of these uh, injuries in. Um, if you've had a significant growth spurt, or you know somebody who has, keep in mind that the skeletal growth outpaces muscular uh, components to keep up. And so someone who sprouts up really quick um, has long bones and tight muscles and are gonna be more likely to have an injury. Those of us who are more sedentary and sit a lot, like we're all doing right now on a webinar, um, if you are a muscle bleeder more than a joint bleeder, you might be more at risk. And hit the button one more time, Brett. And certainly if you have an established history of iliopsoas muscle bleeds. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, two more, Brett, hit that twice more. And the reason why the iliopsoas is so important to this particular topic is because it attaches to the spine and it attaches to your upper thigh. It travels right through the pelvis and is very involved in pelvic motion, particularly pelvic thrusting, which if you think about a, a, a one key activity, I suppose, intercourse, um, which is not the sum total by any stretch of sexual health and sexuality, but it's a component. Um, that's why the iliopsoas muscle is so uh, important when we're discussing this particular topic. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this should really look really familiar. And if we're talking about the iliopsoas, um, at every stage of life these days, from the very young to the much older, we are spending a lot of time seated. And the iliopsoas is on a shortened position. And if you spend a lot of time like that, you're going to have a iliopsoas that is kind of tight. And you're probably in a position that is exactly the opposite from the position most people most often are going to be having intercourse in. Uh, next slide, please particularly during the pandemic, right? We've got entire families now that are sitting in front of computer screens and TV screens for a lot of hours on lots of days. Uh, next slide. So the reason why someone like myself as a physiotherapist sort of has a lot of overlap between my, my um, usual expertise in the area of sexual health is because there's a lot of benefits of, of healthy sexual expression. Um, I think four uh, animations, Brett, if you want to hit it four times. Um, longevity, first of all, and you can actually hit it one more time, Brett. Um, and a, there'll be a lot of people kind of rolling their eyes and smiling, I think, when they read this first bullet point. There's been sociological studies done across a long period of time that shows that men particularly think about sex more often than women, and they think about intercourse a lot more than women do. And women are driven more by quality than quantity, typically, statistically, and are much more driven by intimacy than the actual sex act. But if we do talk about the expression of sexual health in lots of different ways, frequent ejaculation, it's been shown to reduce a man's risk of prostate cancer. There are a lot of good things that happen when you have sex regularly, uh, pain reduction, muscle relaxation, better sleep. So I think that that is a good way of showing why this needs to be discussed and treated as a key component of overall health because it has so many overlaps with the kinds of things that we um, routinely would discuss. Uh, with our patients at uh, something like a hemophilia or a bleeding disorders uh, treatment center. Uh, next slide. Um, this presentation is not meant to be about any particular group, about older people, younger people, about men or about women, because this crosses all of those boundaries, this particular topic. But if I do focus on older people at the moment, next uh, slide. Um, sexuality is certainly something that gets impacted by chronic disease that tends to appear more as we age and it's not impacted in a positive way by things like diabetes or cardiovascular health or hypertension. Next slide. Uh, pain and immobility from arthritis where whatever the cause of the arthritis happens to be tends to decrease uh, libido. Next slide. 
uh, hormonal levels change over time. For men and women, testosterone, because we all have it, is very critical to libido and sexual performance. And uh, so the, the, the decreasing levels of, of testosterone in our bodies will impact sexual performance for men and women, as well as desire. Um, medications will disrupt sometimes our ability to perform and sometimes our, our interest level in having sex. Uh, next slide. Uh, this particular element, of course, um, specific to men. Uh, next slide. You can hit it, I think, a couple more times, Brett. Um, bear in mind that ED is now viewed as an indicator of cardiovascular pathology. We didn't always view it that way, but we do now. And the thing is, when a young man um, experiences erectile dysfunction, he tends to go and seek help about it because he kinds of think, kind of thinks it's not normal. And a lot of older men will do exactly the opposite. They may not seek out any help because they'll just think, well, this is part of me getting older, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, part of the conversation that can be had if a person is interested is to discuss or look at activities that don't require an erection at all to support a healthy sex life and even to improve your sex life. And things like toys and sexual aids can provide an alternative for couples or for more than couples, frankly, if that's um, what your sexual expression involves. Next slide, please. But what about women particularly? I've talked a bit about men. If you think that there's a, a very sort of distinct lack of research uh, available for men on this topic. Um, it's an embarrassment of riches, as I say, compared to what's available for women. And that's a gap that we really need to work, I think, as a community to close. Uh, and at our clinic, for sure, we make sure that we incorporate and extend our services to the partners of people with bleeding disorders, because um, while the individual that we are treating as our patient may want to have conversations with us about this topic or not, uh, it's also the case that their partner may want to have a conversation with us or not, because partners have their own issues when it comes to this topic. And so we make sure that we make ourselves open uh, to all of the key uh, stakeholders involved. Next slide, please. Um, and hit the animation two or three more, uh, three more times. Yeah. And one more time. Good. Um, so we need to change the current landscape. We need to ask patients the right kinds of questions. And asking about unusual physical activity is off the table now in, in our clinic. If we don't make um, a link for people between the potential for sexual expression to create issues or exacerbate issues physically, then that connection may not be made. And so we need to play a role as healthcare providers in making sure that we pay attention to this as an overall element of health. We need to make sure that the services that are available are available to all of our patients and as widely available as possible. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you can, you can hit the button again and you can do it again and again and one more time after that. Yeah, and one more, yeah. So for my part, one of the things that I've done is create a resource aimed for patients that um, provides information on a series of sexual positions and it uses a stoplight kind of concept, green, uh, yellow, and red, and a tabular format as well as a graphic format. And really what it does is it takes those positions and breaks them down into where the stresses are on the body. Green light, green is low stress, Yellow is a bit risky and red is a lot of stress on those particular joints and muscles. And so if you match your body against these positions, you can kind of see where your problem joints might cause a problem if you were trying to choose a position that you and your partner might be able to enjoy in the safest way possible. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a very recent article that uh, we now have in print that details a, an education program that we trialed here in Canada to uh, provide information for treatment team members to make them more comfortable, first of all, uh, as well as to provide them with, with skills that they could use to bring up these conversations and to have these conversations. And uh, I just will end with saying that, that the reminder is, is that this is about being open. This isn't about um, grilling somebody on their sexual health when they come to clinic. It's not that at all. This is about making sure that people understand that we are there to help you and you are uh, free to bring these conversations up and we would be happy to help you the best that we can with the right person at the right time with the right kind of treatment. Uh, next slide, please. And that's it for me. And I am gonna be turning the uh, talk over now to Federico. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, hi, thank you, Greg. And uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, Brett and everyone. So today, um, 
my contribution uh, um, to this uh, talk is uh, uh, a bit of a discussion about how data from the probe study helped us uh, gaining some uh, insight uh, about the um, sexual health uh, in uh, people living with uh, hemophilia. I think we can uh, quickly go over the introduction because um, Greg already um, put, a, put, a, put us uh, on a, a good spot. We all know that sexuality is important to humans. Uh, and we also do know from uh, previous studies that people with a chronic disease often have uh, difficulties with uh, sexuality for reasons that uh, Greg already explained. And again, uh, for reasons that Greg already explained, uh, um, this might uh, potentially be even more frequent uh, uh, or have an important uh, impact in uh, people living uh, with uh, hemophilia uh, as a start uh, because uh, it is an inherited uh, genetic disorder, but then uh, for the presence of comorbidities, uh, um, the uh, higher prevalence uh, of uh, HCV and HIV infections, uh, physical issues uh, in terms of arthropathy, arthrosis and uh, bleedings, uh, and then comorbidity and medications, uh, including uh, psychosocial psycho issues. So for all these reasons, uh, we do know that uh, this problem might have a higher prevalence uh, um, in uh, people uh, living with hemophilia. We, um, however, did not know if this was true and we uh, did not know this uh, from uh, um, solid data. So that's uh, when we thought of using uh, data from the probe study um, to try to address this. In particular, um, do you, you might already know uh, what the probe uh, um, study is. It's basically a questionnaire uh, to collect data on uh, the burden of the disease uh, um, and the quality of life in uh, people living with hemophilia and uh, um, what we call people with no bleeding disorder, meaning uh, not necessarily healthy controls. Um, and you see how, well, the, the, the probe questionnaire has been, you can go to the next slide, sorry. Yes, so that's the, the, the logo of the uh, probe, just to see if you're familiar with it. Um, it's a questionnaire that has been developed by a group of investigators uh, led by uh, Mark Skinner that is on the panel today. I see in the audience uh, uh, Randall Curtis is another investigator, it's a great group. Uh, um, of uh, people with hemophilia and health research methodologists uh, that developed this uh, questionnaire. And uh, next slide, you can see how uh, one of the questions um, is about uh, activity of daily living. There are four sections. So one is uh, baseline data, one is about uh, um, quality of life uh, and burden of the disease, and this includes uh, the evaluation of uh, activity of daily living. And then there's a section on uh, uh, data in the people specific to people with hemophilia. And then uh, as a benchmarking, uh, um, based on a different tool that is called EQ5D, again, to measure uh, the quality of life. So one of the questions is, uh, do you currently have difficulty with any activities of daily living? And if you answer yes, next slide, you will be prompted to select from a list of activities uh, um, and one, in, one of these uh, is sexual intimacy. So this gave us the opportunity to explore uh, how prevalent this is uh, in people with hemophilia and uh, in people uh, with no bleeding disorder. Next slide. And also to explore uh, some, uh, some other uh, um, association uh, with other uh, um, questions and uh, other aspects. So this is the uh, paper from where uh, the data that, were, that I will present uh, come from, next slide. And the objectives uh, of uh, this uh, uh, analysis were uh, the following. Next slide, please. So to determine the prevalence of sexual difficulty in people uh, living with hemophilia, to compare it with people uh, with no bleeding disorder, and then to explore factors associated uh, with sexual difficulty in both the populations, so people with hemophilia and people with no bleeding disorder, to see if there was a difference. Next slide, in terms of inclusion, inclusion criteria, um, we kept it uh, quite simple, so only people with uh, uh, hemophilia and with no bleeding disorder, meaning that we removed uh, from our database uh, um, people uh, with other bleeding disorders uh, and carriers. And then we restricted it uh, to patients uh, aged 18 years or older. Next slide. 
um, previous studies on this topic uh, uh, included uh, we, we have in mind uh, a couple of studies, so not many, and only including around 20 patients. While, uh, as you can see, the strength uh, um, of the probe data set is that uh, there's uh, lots of participants in it that provided answers, so more than 5,000 participants. And from these, we were able to isolate around 2,000 people with hemophilia and uh, a bit short of 2,000 people with no bleeding disorder. Next slide. You can see how obviously most of the uh, people, uh, uh, participants uh, with hemophilia um, were uh, male. The age uh, was uh, around 40 years for both uh, the groups. They, the data were coming mostly from uh, Europe, uh, North and South America and the Western Pacific uh, regions. The distribution of people with hemophilia A and B is the one we are used to. So four out of five were uh, participants were people with uh, hemophilia A. We did have uh, um, mild and moderate uh, represented in our questionnaire, even though uh, in our, uh, among our participants, even though obviously most of the participants were uh, the severes that are more engaged with participating in this kind of uh, studies. And uh, as you can see, uh, maybe better in the next slide, the prevalence of sexual difficulty was much higher um, in people with uh, hemophilia where it reached 15%. So uh, one out of six participants as compared uh, with people with no bleeding disorder where this, uh, the ratio was one uh, out of 25. So a, Person with hemophilia, unfortunately, has more or less four times uh, the odds of having uh, problems uh, with uh, sexual health, what we defined uh, in a, uh, sexual as sexual difficulties. Now, in terms of uh, um, who is more affected, uh, what we wanted to see is, uh, is the prevalence uh, the same across uh, um, people with hemophilia and across uh, people with no bleeding disorder or, or other factors that are associated with uh, having this uh, uh, issue more frequently. And as you can see, most of the health problems reported were associated uh, with a higher prevalence. And in particular, uh, in particular obviously, um, having acute pain or chronic pain were associated uh, with a three and six um, times higher odds uh, of having sexual difficulty, and even more so if these uh, acute or chronic pain were interfering uh, with uh, relationships. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to I forgot to tell you to advance. So that's that's the data that I was uh, mentioning, and then uh, we also explore uh, explore the comorbidities. And again, uh, you can see how having uh, hepatitis B, C, HIV. Uh, a, a history of stroke, hypertension, diabetes, uh, arthritis, obviously, and gingivitis uh, are all associated with more or less two to three um, times higher odds of having uh, um, sexual difficulty. And uh, for these, uh, and also uh, for the previous uh, um, slide, so health problems and comorbidities, the effect of these is more or less the same in people uh, with uh, no bleeding disorder. The issue is that these uh, are much more frequent uh, and more frequently uh, together uh, present uh, in people with uh, hemophilia. And then we went to see if these uh, um, risk factors were independent uh, from one from the other, um, or if uh, they were just uh, expression of the same thing. So for example, having acute pain might be just uh, uh, have an effect because the patient also have uh, chronic pain or is uh, acute pain independent uh, on chronic pain uh, in uh, determining a higher uh, prevalence uh, of uh, sexual difficulty. As, as, as you can see from this uh, uh, multivariable analysis, uh, severe patients uh, um, tended to have uh, uh, more frequently um, presence of uh, sexual difficulty but this was not statistically significant. Well, what we've seen is that uh, for older ages, so every 10 years uh, of increase, uh, there, was, there were higher chances. Uh, oh, yes, next slide, sorry. Yes, you can see here how severe patients had a higher probability, um, but this was not statistically significant, even though the trend is clear. 
but most importantly, um, people of older age uh, had higher probability of having uh, sexual difficulty and same uh, in the present, in presence of acute pain, even more so for chronic pain, uh, having uh, a history of bleeding uh, within the past two weeks, uh, a reduced range of motion of any joint, uh, and uh, a life or limb threatening uh, bleed in the past 12 months. So all of these uh, were independent uh, risk factors uh, for uh, sexual difficulty. Next slide. And so in our study, we concluded that sexual difficulty is more prevalent in people with hemophilia, that health problems and comorbidities resulting in more frequent sexual difficulties in uh, people with hemophilia than in people with no bleeding disorder. And again, uh, we call the community, so healthcare providers, researchers, and policymakers uh, to incorporate sexual health discussion in comprehensive hemophilia care in future research and in health policies. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to show you how um, probe might be used for uh, this as well. So to elicit the discussion of this uh, with your caregivers um, or uh, with your uh, patients. So um, you see how this is the, the dashboard of the probe website. So after uh, a participant completes uh, a probe questionnaire, it reaches this page. And as you see under actions, there's a share button. Next slide. If you hit share, you will be prompted with this window where it gives you a link. You can either copy it and send it to your care provider or ask your patient to do so. Or you can directly use this send via email button and this will open your email client. And we think that this might help uh, advancing the discussion around this and in general around uh, quality of life uh, and uh, reviewing uh, pain and other issues uh, in the uh, clinical uh, setting. And we're also exploring the use of this function uh, um, with a group of investigators in Vancouver. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, keep you posted on how this uh, worked in, in real world clinical practice. Next slide. This is just a QR code that you can use to complete the probe questionnaire in case you didn't so already. And thank you, everyone. I'll hand the floor to Elizabeth to continue. Hi, thank you, Federico, um, for introducing me. Uh, I'm Elizabeth, and today I will be talking about uh, what we've learned about sexual health in people with hemophilia while we were working on the CORHEME project. So just as a brief overview, this project is developing a PRO, I have that here in the title, which is a patient reported outcome. And in this case, we're working on a questionnaire that people with hemophilia will fill out about topics that impact their mental health outlook. And in this case, mental health outlook refers not to clinically diagnosed mental illness, but a person's attitude and how they feel about living with and treating their hemophilia. And I'm going to show you how we learned that sexual health is an important part of mental health outlook. And Brett, you can go to the next slide. So let me take you back a bit and give you some background. The Core Hume Initiative started in 2017, and the goal was to come to consensus on a core outcome set which is a small list of outcomes that are deemed as the most important to include in all clinical trials for a particular disease area. And in this case, we were considering gene therapy for hemophilia because at the time there were several upcoming gene therapy trials and we wanted everybody to be aligned on what outcomes they would measure. So we started out with a list of 48 outcomes you can see on the right here. And we went through a consensus exercise which is called a Delphi. And the group prioritized that list down to six outcomes. And one of these outcomes was the mental health outlook outcome. With gene therapy, there's expected to be a transformational change in the lives of those who receive this durable treatment. And the Delphi panel agreed that this transformation could be seen uh, with a change in mental health outlook. And however, there was no instrument that could measure this change or could measure this transformational change or capture what was going to be expected with something like gene therapy or any novel therapy, uh, in fact. So what we set out to do was to develop one and that's where the core human mental health project came about. So this was follow on work to the core outcome set. 
And we set out to develop a questionnaire for that mental health outlook outcome. And we can do next slide, please. So the first step in developing the mental health outlook questionnaire was to do something called concept elicitation interviews. And this is to learn how living with hemophilia and treating your hemophilia impacts a person's mental health outlook. And this is where we learned that sexual health and sexual difficulty related to hemophilia can impact mental health outlook. So we did 32 interviews with people age 15 or older who had moderate or severe hemophilia A or B. And the mean age there was 38.4. And we had a, this type of interview uh, is a conversation and we asked the question, does hemophilia affect your sexual or romantic relationships and how does that make you feel? And the responses to this question kind of fell into two categories related to the sexual health side of things. Um, physical intimacy and a lot of people who had some hesitancy for the physical intimacy. And then also for sexual experience, the sexual experiences for people who had HIV or hepatitis C, um, talking about their experience with that. Next slide. So here um, I have some example quotes from those interviews and just to orient you, um, I have added some bold highlights in. So these are my own highlights um, because I wanted to show you some things that I thought were important. And at the end of the quote, you can see the age and the country where the uh, speaker was coming from. So the quote on the left with the white background, we have a young man, 20 years old, and he mentions that you know physical intimacy is an embarrassing topic for him, but he says that he's had joint bleeds and he has had some issues with sex related to his hemophilia and those joint bleeds. He mentions that he needs to be careful. And then later in the second part of the quote towards the bottom of the uh, quote box, he says he doesn't wanna be that guy in the ER who's come into the emergency room with this issue. Uh, next, we have the quote on the right with the, with the blue. And this is another young man, only 18 years old. And he's mentioning that he thinks he's not like guys his age and he's not rushing into having sex. And this is again, in the context of his hemophilia. Uh, you know, that's what we were asking about. And he said he would really want to make sure that a partner would understand hemophilia and how sex could affect him before he would do that. We can go to the next slide. And then on this slide, I have some quotes about HIV and hepatitis C status um, from some of our participants. In the top left, in the light blue, you can see that this person is noting that they believe abstinence is the safest bet for them. And then on the top right in the dark blue, another speaker states that they're afraid of intimacy because of their status. So these are quotes showing that us that HIV and hepatitis C status are important to mental health and also to your sexual health. Down with the quote at the bottom, uh, to give you a little bit of context, this person is talking about a group of people that they know that they meet with who have hemophilia, kind of like a blood brothers group. And they mention that they're only one of two in that group of people who have had children. And that was because of their HIV status. And they mentioned that, you know, there was fear about spreading it. And at the time when he was trying to have children, he uh, learned he would not be able to adopt when he had HIV. So this was an important aspect to him, not only with the physical aspect of having sex, but also the importance of how having children, uh, biological children is related to having sex. So we can move to the next slide. So we were seeing this connection uh, between sexual health and the ability and willingness to have sexual relations and how that was associated with a person's mental health. Again, this whole questionnaire is really about mental health. So we felt sure that we should put a questionnaire, um, a question about sex on our questionnaire. So here's the example questions and it's gone through many iterations. So we're working on a draft of this questionnaire, but at first we put in, um, you know, kind of, we kept it kind of light and we said, in the past 30 days, my hemophilia interfered with my romantic relationships. Um, so we were alluding, we were trying to allude to sexual health there, but in our feedback, we realized that a lot of people were just thinking about their dating life and you know, finding a, boy, a boyfriend or girlfriend and they weren't really thinking specifically about sex with the way we phrased it. So we said, okay, we need to be a little bit more straightforward so that we're clear what we're talking about. So in the second version of the questionnaire, we changed it to, my hemophilia interferes with my sexual encounters. Again, we had some confusion with that as well. Uh, we tested that with 17 people and some people said that the word encounter made them feel that we were talking about something like a one night stand or what they would call more risky sex or perhaps with a sex worker and not necessarily sex as part of their, their daily life. 
So we again realize we just need to be very straightforward and ask directly about a person's sex life. So now we have the third version you see here, and this is what's being tested. My hemophilia interferes with my sex life. Um, we've also asked people about the word interfere and whether or not that is a word that, you know, makes sense. And if that's how they feel about this, when they think about their hemophilia and their sex life and the general consensus is that this has been a good way to describe this. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So we took this latest version, which again says my hemophilia interferes with my sex life and they can answer on a scale that goes from very much to not at all. And we're currently testing it in a series of interviews. And this method is called cognitive debriefing. Um, so we're testing the questionnaire now. We have our concepts, we're testing the questionnaire. So, so far we've done 24 of those interviews and it's the same inclusion criteria, um, age 15 or older, moderate or severe hemophilia A or B. And in, uh, we are planning to do up to 30 of these interviews. And here, what we're asking is whether uh, they understand the question, how they like the wording, and if this topic is relevant to their mental health or if they think it's relevant to the mental health of people with hemophilia. So we can move to the next slide. So we've had some mixed responses to this question, which is not unexpected. Some people are pretty agreeable to discuss the topic and are happy to see it on the questionnaire. And others are a little bit more hesitant. So here's some more quotes. Um, this first person uh, on the top left, age 47 from Canada. So, uh, and these were people who were pretty agreeable to discuss this. Um, though he says he feels that this question is more related to a person's HIV status, um, they do say that if you have a bleed and you might have to come up with an excuse that night why you might not want to have sex. Um, so clearly that's something that's relevant to mental health if you're trying to come up with excuses and that can impact you. Uh, the, another person in light blue on the right says they feel that anyone who's orthopedically involved is going to have difficulty having sex. So they were happy to see that question there. On the bottom left in the dark blue, um, we have a 29 year old and they say, you know, this is a relevant question. We should keep it on the questionnaire and it's a big part of mental health. And finally on the bottom right, we have another person from the UK and this person mentions they don't remember ever being asked this. And that goes back to Greg's anecdote and Greg's story that sexual health was, you know, usually not, is usually not being brought up in the clinic. Um, but they say it was nice to see that it was asked and that it's obviously a big link to mental health. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, we did have some people uh, who were hesitant to discuss this. And, you know, we expected this, of course. Some people are surprised to see this question um, on a questionnaire that they think is about mental health. And so maybe they think it's going to be uh, mainly about emotions. Um, and we did tell people uh, as we were doing these interviews that we might cut some questions out to make the questionnaire a little bit shorter. So you might see some references to that. This first person in the dark blue, that's why they say they would put number 19 under review. So they're suggesting that we cut this question out. They don't think um, we need to ask about it. And then they go on to say, you know, you should give people an option to not answer it um, because it's highly personal. So uh, they say that we could put a box that says refuse to answer or something like that. And, uh, you know, they really want to avoid answering that question. We also have in the top right on the white background, this person says, you know, they don't really know why we're asking this. They think that we've covered it with other questions we have about physical limitations, which we do have questions about physical limitations, just not necessarily um, specifically about sex like this question is. And then on the bottom right, we have another person who says, you know, they were thrown off by the question. Um, and, you know, they, they, their first response was, whoa. So they suggested that if we are going to keep it on, we should put it towards the end of the survey. So that was quite shocking to them to see a question about sexual health and their sex life. So we can go to the next page. And so we had to make some decisions about how, you know, are we going to keep this question on the questionnaire? And how is it, you know, how will we best convey that we think that this is important to mental health? So we have decided to include the question about sex life. Um, we learned that we need to make it very straightforward and just ask specifically what we what we want to know. So does hemophilia impact, you know, does it interfere with your sex life? And we do have the option to select not applicable. So if somebody really doesn't want to answer it or they are not having sex, um, they can choose not applicable. We've also decided to pair this question uh, about the physical aspect of sexual of sex life and sexual health with a question about 
hemophilia and starting a family and whether or not that caused stress, the decision to start a family as a person with hemophilia. So we've put them together side by side. And then um, our thoughts are that more, more discussion at HTCs regarding sexual health could lead to more comfort. Um, you know, so more discussions as Greg is suggesting need to happen that could be uh, make people less likely to be surprised when if they see this on a questionnaire, if, they, if it's already something they've heard about from their doctor or discussed um, at their HTC visits. And so that is the end of mine. And I'm going to hand it back to Mark for some takeaways from uh, today's presentations. Mark, you might be muted. Mark, I think you might be muted there. I'm sorry, I think maybe I'm a bit of technical difficulty. Uh, it's okay, Mark. I mean, if you if you want to continue like that, it's um, it's the audio is a little bit choppy, but I think we can understand you. And I apologize to everyone out there. Okay, uh, apologies uh, to all. So we have heard from what I believe is one of the leading global healthcare professionals who has chosen to integrate uh, sexual health and intimacy into the clinic setting and uh, has been speaking and writing and lecturing on this for a number of years. We've heard from uh, Federico who has shared the results of the probe study, which we believe is the largest just a global data set to uh, have routinely included uh, sexual health and intimacy as an activity of daily living, reporting on intimacy uh, issues. And we have heard from uh, Elizabeth about some of the future plans. Uh, so hopefully this will be built in to the future research uh, as we think about advances in therapies. And so with that, uh, you see this, uh, the summary of our talk that hemophilia and its complications can negatively affect sexual health sexual activity might be related to bleeding episodes, so it merits uh, discussion and conversation. And people with hemophilia are likely to have sexual difficulty. Next slide, please. Sex life is related to their mental health as we've demonstrated from our focus groups, both within uh, PROBE and uh, the Core Heme Project. Some people will be more willing to discuss it than others, uh, but that consistently across these three research sets, uh, it has come up and we believe that each have concluded that it should be part of comprehensive care. The next slide includes our contact information. If you'd like to reach out to any of us, or certainly you may do so and find us through NHF. And then we have two reference slides which provide you the details for the publication. These are the key references uh, uh, which have all been published in hemophilia. And then the next slide is a series of additional references if you'd like to look beyond uh, the primary publications. And with that, Brett, we'll turn it back over to you to uh, facilitate the conversation. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, everyone, for presenting. We truly appreciate it. We do have some questions that have come in, and I'll start with this one. Um, while the identification of sexual health is fantastic, how can we help people with bleeding disorders experiencing sexual health issues best? Um, I'll start, maybe, and then everybody else can sort of chime in. And I think that the key to that for me is, is kind of wrapped up in that second challenge that I listed on my slide about making sure that this is a topic that is uh, free to be discussed. And most in my experience, most of the time, if I, if I determine an issue with one of my patients or with, with uh, a partner of one of my patients, if I go back, there's usually a period of time where if we could have had the conversation earlier, like with most problems, it didn't need to get as complicated as it did when it eventually got dealt with. So I think what we need to do is recognize that we are not necessarily, A, within the hemophilia treatment world, the people who will be dealing with the solution, but we are people who can help direct people to the resources that they need to get the solutions. And so it's almost like being an, an intake, a referral intake center in a way, and that a lot of the problems or a lot of the issues that people might want to bring up, A, do it with whichever, we need to make sure people can do it with whichever team member they feel most comfortable with. 
and we need to be able to root that person and their question and their issue to the experts that do have the resources to make sure that the problem can be dealt with. So I think it's a lot about that permission kind of culture, as well as making sure that we have established links so that it's not just, nobody wants to bring up an issue like that and then have it just sit there and not be dealt with. So it's not the kind of thing I can say, well, you know what, um, thanks for bringing that up and uh, I'll look into what we can do and I'll get back to your next appointment. That's a one-way ticket to that kind of conversation never happening again in my in my experience. So so clinics need to do the work up front and make sure that we've we have identified what kinds of resources exist within our um, within our clinic space, within our, our region, so that we have that information at the ready when these conversations come up so that we can give the person the, the immediate access that they're looking for. Great, great. Thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate that. We've got a couple of questions that are coming through the Q&A that I'll ask. Um, the first one comes in from Prasad Matthew. Thank you, Prasad. Um, would you see a difference in your responses now that more patients are on prophylaxis with factor or non-factor therapies? Maybe I can take these. I guess uh, this refers to the prevalence that we found uh, um, in the probe study. Um, and uh, well, in terms of regular prophylaxis, I think this was covered because data are uh, quite recent. Um, so I think this uh, um, is applicable uh, to people uh, that are on regular prophylaxis. Now, the, F, the effect of regular prophylaxis, uh, we will continue seeing them because uh, um, not everyone that is around now has been on uh, regular prophylaxis uh, since when they were born. So we, we might see a trend uh, toward improvement uh, um, with this and hopefully also with non-factor uh, um, therapy and with gene therapy. We all hope uh, that the difference between uh, people with hemophilia and people with no bleeding disorder will become thinner and thinner. So this might change over time. We, we, we hoped it will do, um, but we did not look into um, a time trend for this. So I can't answer for sure. Great, thanks Federico. The next question comes in from Lawrence over in the UK and um, this is a, a little bit long, so bear with me here. Um, Lawrence asks, hi, this is Lawrence from the UK. Thanks again for a great webinar addressing such critical subject. Um, I'd like to ask Greg how much he thinks we need to support a culture shift in clinic so HCPs are more open to discussing sex and sexual experiences with their patients. He goes on to ask, this becomes increasingly difficult if patients have been with their healthcare team since childhood, where there isn't a transition of care to a different team or clinic. In some instances, lads associate their nurses as a second mom. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of there are a lot of great points within that question, and and I think particularly when we're talking about a disease like hemophilia, so an overrepresentation of male patients, and historically hemophilia nurses who are always one of the primary contacts, again almost to exclusion at least in my country, uh, being female. And as uh, Lawrence has said, you know a lot of these folks, this is their nurse, they've known their nurse an awfully long time and she kind of takes on a, uh, almost like a motherly kind of quality. And, and the difficulty for patients to bring these topics up is real. And so uh, in answer to how much of a culture shift do we need? It of course varies from clinic to clinic, but in, in general, I would say we need a huge culture shift. Um, and that's why this webinar is taking place because really sexual health and sexuality needs to flow from the discussion as easily as we talk to our patients about their dental health, about their orthopedic health, about any element of their life that is that is something that we want to try to help them move to a, a, a greater degree or a more satisfying degree. Um, so the answer is that it's, it varies from clinic to clinic, but for sure, um, we need to challenge assumptions because I think that when I did the research that I've done with the, with the, the healthcare teams in Canada, what we found was most of the healthcare providers were really uncomfortable bringing it up. Most of them thought the patients didn't want to discuss it, which was wrong as we found out because uh, um, we found that the patients really did want to discuss it, but didn't feel that they were allowed to bring it up. And so there's a lot of assumptions going on back and forth. And I think what we need to do is just try to, again, open the conversation, make the door open to conversation. And it's not about, as I said, grilling somebody or, or asking a, a 
peppering them with questions. It can be as simple as, you know what, especially as teenagers are moving from pediatric kind of clinic into a more adult phase. Now that you're getting older, there's gonna be some changes in your care and the way that we ask you questions and the kinds of things that we ask about. So we want you to understand that for things like, and then you can fill in the list, but that includes issues related to your sexual health, we're here for you. And we're here to, to help you with any problems or questions that you might have. And it, it's amazing how easy it gets after you've done it a couple of times. But um, I find that really it's, it's, it's getting over that initial hurdle of bringing it up and then people kind of realize that it really wasn't that big a deal after all. If I could, just, if I could chime in and just add a, a couple of comments. The reason we paired the, the talks together today was uh, really to get to the, the question that Lawrence asked is that we, we do need to shift the mindset. And one of the things that we've been working on with Probe, uh, as well as part of really any uh, patient reported outcome research, is that, that data really becomes empowering and can even help ease into a conversation. So uh, it, uh, a questionnaire like Probe uh, could be used in a preclinic setting almost as a screening tool to raise topics that were identified, just sort of depersonalize and raise it and allow a clinician to compare. Uh, it could also be used to empower uh, as an individual living with a bleeding disorder to say uh, this, uh, you know, I see that I'm having issues and it's similar to others and want to discuss it with the clinic. Uh, I really think that the more we talk about it, the more we integrate it into routine practice, to just like I would be asked about my sporting activity, my other kinds of daily activities, it will become much easier. Consistently, this came up in the focus groups when we were designing the questionnaire, that it was something that guys wanted to talk about um, uh, within, uh, within the quality of life and how hemophilia was affecting it. Greg raised one other important point, that it isn't just physical therapy. There were a number of important things which we have not yet published related to sexual health and uh, oral health. Um, bleeding gums, gingivitis can lead to halitosis. And, uh, and uh, a couple individuals commented that they had great difficulty finding someone to date, uh, that nobody wanted to kiss them, that they weren't gonna be able to have a, a partner because of, of the bad breath and the other challenges that came with bleeding gums. So it really needs to be thought of holistically, not just the physical therapist, but really every healthcare professional and whichever one uh, the patient has the most comfort with uh, can bring it up and then engage the rest of the team. Great, thank, thank you both very much for answering that. Um, we do have a couple more questions. We've got a few more minutes here. I'm gonna ask this, um, were women and transgender people included in the study or does this data purely represent males? I can comment. Uh, we do not yet have, but we are planning to include um, additional um, demographic questions uh, beyond male and female and, and recognize that is important and part of health equity. So I think uh, in the future, you can see that uh, we do collect uh, information on women, but the, the data set at this point was not large enough to publish, but perhaps in a subsequent public publication, we can do that. Uh, perhaps Greg can speak to his research. Uh, yeah, if, if, with relation to the work that I've done, uh, in the answer to that, there may have been it, the, the um, identifying sort of uh, information on individuals did not ask people to declare um, their gender or their um, any of their specific identifying information. Really, it was about their perceptions as a person. It really went no further than that. Great, thanks again. And we got, we got time for one more question here. Um, and that is, uh, what are your future plans for establishing full validity and reliability of probe? Sorry, can you repeat that please? I, I, yeah, sure, Mark. It's, it's what are your future plans for establishing full validity and re reliability of probe? So we do believe that we have completed the uh, essential and core elements of validation in terms of content, uh, reproducibility, uh, regional variation, uh, the, uh, the psychometric tools, uh, and we have other publications in process. But we do believe that Probe can be considered uh, a validated instrument uh, similar to others that are in use uh, and is ready for prime time, but like all 
PROs, uh, the strength of, of, of that nation will continue to grow. Um, so I, I'm not sure if there was a specific element in mind, but I'd be happy to discuss it uh, offline if they want to follow up. But as of now, a uh, probe should be considered a validated instrument. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks to all of our panelists for joining us today and presenting and taking the time out of your busy schedules. We truly appreciate it here. Um, and thank each and every one of you for joining us again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. If you'd like to access this, it will be um, the recording will be available on Friday, uh, January 21st on the events tab at hemophilia.org, along with the other um, events, uh, events coming up in our Wednesday webinars coming up well too. Um, again, thank you to our panel. We truly appreciate you, you taking the time to, uh, to present to the community and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, thanks.